So I'm Elizabeth. I'm the owner of Extraordinary Journeys. Um, I'm very excited to have everyone here today to hear about Laura's recent trip. Uh, Laura, if you can just like raise your hand. I'm not mm -hmm. sure who, if everyone can see mm -hmm. Laura. Um, Laura just came back from Uganda. Um, she was there in January and we thought this would be a really good opportunity to talk about her experience in Uganda. Also, how it is um, to you know, what it was like to travel also during COVID and her experience there, um, especially as people are going to look to travel as people get vaccinated or want to travel, what it's like to travel in Uganda right now. But more than that, um, you know, everyone thinks Uganda is about just about guerrilla trekking. There's a lot more to do in Uganda. So we also want to take this opportunity to talk about all the different experiences and also talk about Rwanda um, and the experience there. Lara's also been to Rwanda. Just as a background, everyone on the team, most of us have been guerrilla trekking. Uh, today, Lara is speaking, but if anyone's traveled with us before, you know, a lot of us, you know, Jamie, who's here today, Jenny, Kim, myself, uh, Amelia. I mean, I can pretty much like most, most of us have been guerrilla trekking. So we all know a lot about it, but today uh, Lara is gonna be speaking about about the experience and she was the one who most recently traveled. So um, again, thank you for joining us. Please, I think the easiest, I have everyone on mute just because there's always a lot of background noise. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions. So if you can just type them up in the chat, um, I'll be reading them. If there's one that can be answered easily along the way, we'll do it. If not, um, we'll just kind of try to do the Q and A um right afterwards so um just you know keep your questions to them but type them as they go along and i'll try to read them out so laura i will let you kind of introduce yourself and take it from here perfect thank you so much um and i'm going to minimize um so welcome everybody i'm really appreciative of you making time to join us to talk a little bit about uganda and rwanda um, as elizabeth mentioned i'm just just recently back from visiting Uganda and I was in Rwanda fall of 2019. So not too, too long ago. Um, so it's really fun to be able to have um, seen both places um, pretty close to back to back and um, just really wanting today to talk about primate trekking and um, talking about each country and similarities and differences, um, which there are wonderful, um, unique things about each place. So just to set um, where we are in Africa, um, I feel like most of us on this call are pretty familiar with where Kenya and Tanzania are on the map. So Rwanda and Uganda are really neighboring right next door. Um, Uganda is here um, a little bit more north and Rwanda is a little bit tucked in right below that. Um, Rwanda is much smaller than Uganda, which you can see here. Um, and they are also um, easily linked to Kenya and Tanzania. Um, traditionally, I feel like a lot of people would just think of them as an add-on. Um, they have these strong similarities, the gorilla trekking and chimpanzee trekking um, in both countries, but there's a lot more to them than just that. Um, and while the trekking is similar in many ways, um, they both have their own distinctive features for those two activities as well. I'm going to start off with Uganda today. Um, I promise I don't have too many wordy slides. I have a lot of nice pictures to share. Um, but just to start us off, I just wanted to sort of frame Uganda and some of the um, main points that we want to make sure that we chat about today. Um, so Uganda is much larger than Rwanda. Um, it is very diverse. This is one of the most um, large impressions that I took away just with multiple mountain ranges, um, huge open plains, lots of rivers, large, large rift valley lakes. There's just a very diverse landscape here to explore. It is not just mountains and gorillas. <laughs> so that, um, that is something that I knew theoretically, but it was really exciting to be able to see in person, um, especially for just classic game viewing. So it was really fun. Um, another point to make is that when compared to Rwanda, which we'll delve into a little bit later, 
Um, there's more options for mid-range accommodations. Um, Rwanda is much more focused on the luxury market and um, Uganda has luxury for sure, but also lots of good options at the middle range, which is great. Um, because it is a big country, there are definitely some long road transfers. Um, if you do a full driving itinerary all over Uganda, it can take a while. Um, it's really nice to mix that in with some flights. Um, they have a really good airline, internal airline there, um, Aerolink, that we used for this most recent trip that I was on. Um, we did quite a bit of flying. Um, but that's something when you're building an itinerary with your safari specialist, um, you'll work out what makes the most sense um, coming and going. There are multiple trekking options um, for primates in Uganda, where there are fewer options in Rwanda. Um, permit costs are lower as well. Um, the biggest difference being the permits in for gorilla trekking in, um, excuse me, in Uganda are $700 per person per trek um, compared to Rwanda that's $1,500 per person per trek. Um, activities abound, as I was mentioning before. There's just so much um, as far as if somebody really wants to be active, this is a place to do it. Um, hiking, biking, rafting, even fishing for Nile perch, um, different kinds of treks. There's just a lot of activities to be done. Um, chimpanzees, well, I've got the two primates here. Chimpanzees can be viewed in multiple locations. Um, the Chibali area is great. Um, it's a really, I, don't know, I think it's probably like 98% chance that you're gonna see them there. Um, so it's a really, almost a sure thing, um, which is great when you're wildlife viewing. Um, and then for gorillas, you've got your options of classic gorilla trekking, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a minute, as well as the option for something called a habituation trek, um, which I'll also dive into, but it's basically spending a bit longer with the gorilla family. Um, as mentioned earlier, classic safari locations, um, which we'll explore through pictures in just a moment. Um, but there's several different very good wildlife areas um, for just seeing everything from elephants and giraffe, um, a lot of hippos in Uganda. So there's just a real, a real myriad of different animals to see um, even beyond the, the great apes. Um, also, culture and community, I had some really wonderful experiences um, just in the short time I was there visiting some local programs. Um, at the moment, because of COVID, there's a little less available, um, but what I was able to visit was wonderful um, and a lot of meaningful work being done and things that are really approachable as well for the average visitor. So you can, you can feel like you're making some really interesting cultural connections um, on a trip to Uganda. And deep diving into some really interesting um, lengthy um, visits with experts. So I mentioned the gorilla um, habituation. There's also chimpanzee habituation where you do pay more for that permit but you're able to go out with um, the folks that are basically getting the family of primates used to being around people. So you have a much longer time with them. And I think the takeaway is actually pretty deep as well, as far as understanding behavior. Um, I think it's, it can be a very hands-on experience because the animals are not setting still. They're not totally used to people yet. Um, so it's probably good for folks that can be pretty active, but it is um, something that is really special. And similarly, I was able, I didn't do the habituation visit myself, so I can't speak first person about that. I did go out with um, a, the carnivore conservation team in Queen Elizabeth National Park. And that was really interesting, learning about all of the different ways that they're monitoring carnivores um, in this huge park and helping um, mitigate community um, and carnivore issues. Um, there's collar, there's lots of collared animals um, part, that are part of this program to help with tracking. And um, 
it was it was a really really interesting um, morning that I spent with them. Something I would recommend to anybody who's interested in learning a bit more about cats. Um, it was really interesting. Here is a closer map, um, just again to highlight where we are in the world. Uganda has um, in dark green multiple parks. And um, starting off at the bottom is where we were gorilla trekking, um, which we'll be showing pictures of. Windy in front of Trouble Forest. Queen Elizabeth National Park is sort of long and skinny and has um, a northern sector and a southern sector. The northern sector is where I was able to visit. Murchison Falls National Park is here in the center and the Nile River runs through it. And then at the very top, we have Kadepo National Park, which is on the border of South Sudan and has um, just a myriad of wonderful animals, um, lots and lots of wildlife to look at there. And it also feels very, very remote. It's a pretty cool place. Starting off when you arrive into Uganda, most likely you will be staying in Entebbe. That is where the main airport is. Um, it's a fairly clean, modern airport. Things ran really efficiently there. Um, there were no crazy lines. There was lots of safety checks and it was a very pleasant entry point um, within probably uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, we were in the section of Entebbe where most of the hotels are. Um, I stayed at a lovely sort of boutique hotel called Hotel Number no. 5 that Extraordinary Journeys likes to use. Um, it feels very safe, clean. The food is love great. The people are lovely. Um, it, was a, it was a very easy entry into being in Uganda. And after all the long plane rides, it was really welcome. They have a nice gym. They have this beautiful pool. Um, really, really easy. Um, just spending a little bit of time, most people are gonna have a day or two in Kigali. Um, this bottom right photo is me at the um, Gorilla Conservation Cafe, which was a, it's a great community project that's also a conservation project to help gorillas. It was started by um, a wildlife veterinarian, Dr. Gladys. It's a really cool project um, and one of just many that I was exposed to. Um, and then the next morning we were ready to set off uh, on safari. Um, and just so you know, I was traveling with a small group of other agents. So you'll see these four, <laughs> well, myself and three other people um, together in a lot of pictures. And just so everyone knows, we'll, we'll go over some of the requirements of how to get into Uganda. I mean, right now during COVID, you know, you need a COVID PCR test to be able to get in and how they do all of that. So we will answer those questions and how Uganda and Rwanda are handling COVID requirements at this time. Um, so just, I know there are a few questions out there that I saw pop up, but we will, well, we will go over that. Definitely. Okay. Um, and then what I wanted to start off with is really talking a little bit about um, the gorilla trekking part. Um, some people have been before, many of you may not have been. Um, it all starts off, it's, it's a bit different than normal safari. It starts off at the park headquarters. So you and your travel companions head to the park headquarters first thing in the morning. Um, you check in um, during the time of COVID. You you have your uh, release form, a health form that you're that you have to fill out. Um, and then basically, and this works the same as in Rwanda, and it's a similar process for chimpanzee trekking to some degree as well. Um, but basically, you head to a park headquarters, you don't have your own guide necessarily, you're going to be using your park guide. Um, this lovely lady on the right hand side was our guide. Um, and she tells us all about the family that we're going to visit. Um, and then I'll back up a second, depending on how many other individuals are there to go trekking that day. Um, you'll be divided into groups. So there's only up to eight people in a group with one park guide. And they do try to make the groups um, adjusted for fitness levels. And um, they, they kind of have a good idea of which families are where kind of on the mountain, how difficult the treks might be. 
So an effort is made to try to match someone who's got a, a lower fitness level with a closer family um, and someone who's, you know, young and can go hike pick up that mountain all day long, they're going to go, um, you know, to probably a, a, a more challenging hike. It doesn't always work out that way because these are wild animals and they do actually move around some. So there can be times when uh, a, a close family has then decided to move further away. Um, but an effort is made to, um, to make sure that you're hiking to the, to the gorilla family that's the right level distance for you. Um, one thing that is also available um, to either pre-book or you can kind of do it on the fly is you, if someone is trekking and decides that they cannot physically make it up the hill, up the mountain, or they decide ahead of time that for whatever reason they, they would like to have some assistance, um, there is a way to order um, it's basically it's called a sedan chair or a helicopter is what they locally call it and you end up um, getting in a in a really comfortable chair um, that's on poles and you get carried um, with porters up the mountain um, so that someone in my group actually ended up doing that and it was great because um, she was able to to see the gorillas and it was really a wonderful thing so um if that is something that ever is, you know, as you're planning a trip, um, something you want to explore, just ask your safari specialist to learn a little bit more about that. Um, but I mentioned the word porters, and that's another really important aspect to bring up. Um, in both Rwanda and Uganda, um, being a porter is a, is a good job. Um, so we encourage our clients to always try to book a porter. I um, mean, you do it right there when you sign, when you get to the park headquarters. Um, and that person is going to carry your backpack with you for you and even if you're perfectly able to carry your own backpack um, again it gives gives somebody local um, an opportunity to make some money as well as they are incredibly nice and really helpful so um, they're you know able to help push you and pull you up the mountain um, answer questions um, and just really be a general helping hand, which some tracks are pretty long so it's really nice to have um, this is a picture from my most recent trek, and uh, we've got on the bottom there, porters are your best friends. Um, this young lady was my, who's looking at the camera, was my porter, um, and she was a big help. We, um, we also all just had, it was nice to have a big bunch of people. Um, it was about a two and a half hour trek up to where the gorillas were, and it was steep and long, um, so it was really nice to have some help. Um, and this, this picture also just shows what the terrain is like. This was in a pretty open area, um, but the forest is actually can be very dense and it's um, very old growth. There's a lot of really big old trees and it's quite, quite thick. Um, there's a lot of bird life as well, uh, butterflies, little streams and stuff. It's very, very much of a jungle trek um, and really, I thought, spectacularly beautiful. I have to say, I thought the, the trek was a, a hidden highlight that I hadn't anticipated um, just with how gorgeous this terrain is. These are the gorillas that I actually got to see just a few weeks ago, um, the Mubari group. They were, I believe, the first habituated family um, in the windy and penetrable forest. So a really um, special time when you're gorilla trekking, you spend one hour once you actually reach the family of gorillas. So I was just mentioning it took about, we started off at the park headquarters. That could take anywhere, I don't know, a half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour to get everybody set up and situated. And then you set off. Um, my trek took about two and a half hours until we reached where the gorilla family was. And then there are um, rangers who stay with the gorilla family during the day and um, they're, they're in communication by radio um, with the ranger who's with the people that are coming to visit so that you um, know where you're going. Um, and these guys were in really thick brush. You can see um, the, I believe this is the silverback in the back. 
you could easily walk by them and not know that they're there. They're not particularly noisy all the time. Um, and they are just feeding and hanging out. Um, and so they actually, the park people will cut back some of the brush so that you can see them um, without disturbing the animals. They really don't seem to care. They're, they're quite habituated to people. Um, and it was nice to see them close, but we were also um, trying always to be very aware of how close, so you don't want to get too close. Um, and then we were all wearing masks as well because they can catch things from people. And with COVID right now, it's really something that everybody needs to be super, super aware of and safe with. Um, so, Laura, I'm yeah. actually going to ask some questions just came up and I thought it would be a good opportunity. Absolutely. So one of them was about the social distancing, of course, with gorillas, which is of concern and just you just answered it there. Um, another one was, um, do you, how many gorilla families are there in Uganda that are habituated? And this is the key word is habituated. These are families that you can visit. Um, and I, I don't know the exact number, but I believe there's probably at least six or seven um, in this windy area. I can find out and let you guys know. And I believe there are 10 in Rwanda right now that you can visit. So they do limit the number of people doing COVID. Um, I know in Rwanda, they're limiting six people per family. Normally it would be eight. So in, you're uh, in Uganda, there was still eight, but um, that they it could have been up to eight but our group was only six and um, there was another group that was seven that went out the same day which was a very low number of people to go gorilla trekking so and those people were all together so it was really just i do think they're trying to they're trying to limit it um and then and just to chime in here as well there's um so there's two parts of windy and then in this in the other sector there are more families to track so you can, depending on where you're staying, you can, you know, either drive further away to have the opportunity to track a different family, or you can switch parts Correct. of the park. Yep. So there's a lot. Actually, someone, um, there are actually 20 groups in Bwindi, 20 gorilla families yeah. all together. Um, just in Laura's sector, there was, right, there's, there's eight. about eight, but all of Bwindi, there are about 20 families. Um, so that, and then in terms of one other question that came up was like, how large is a family? Um, two, no, would be small for a family. Um, but, you know, they can get quite big. I know like the Sambino family and were Wander for a while must have had, I mean, I'm almost gonna say they had 40 and then they had to split. Say, they can get up, up into at least into the thirties and then they can be as small. It seems like it depends on if they have babies or not, but they can be as small as, you know, eight or 10. Because they'll split up, especially when they get that big. Usually, like the Sambino family split up. It was very well known for being a very big family, and then they split up. So that you know, um, there are different sizes of families for sure. And some have twins, some have babies. That's why it's always interesting, you know, when people ask us, "Do you do one or two gorilla treks?" Well, you know, each family is so different. The dynamic in each family is so different. And some of them have a lot of babies, and some of them have a really, um, some of them have older um, gorillas. Some of them have a very bunch of you know, like young male coming up. So I, I, I think they're all very, you know, I, ideally I do think two gorilla treks is nice because they I are quite be. different. Yeah, and there's, it, it's also um, when you're with the gorillas, it is very easy to, you just have that one hour. It's very easy to get uh, lost in taking pictures. And I do feel like if, um, if you're able to do two, just being more in the moment with them, um, for the second trek is, it would be really nice. Um, so I, I certainly would recommend that as well, Elizabeth. Just some more pictures. Speaking of babies, we had this guy who was so cute entertaining us. <laughs> he was trying to get really close to, we were always backing away. Um, but yeah, this, this particular family had four young ones and this one in particular was very boisterous and playful. Um, and that's just a picture of me, just kind of, again, to show the background, how um, I'm not too close. There's a lot of foliage um, everywhere. And, um, and I was wearing my KN95 mask um, when I saw the gorillas, when we were trekking and at the park, we didn't necessarily have to wear those, but just to be close to the gorillas, it was the right thing. 
Yeah, and someone's asking what happens if you only have an hour, what happens if they take off? You just continue following them. So some of these treks, you are trekking while they're, yeah. it's like some gorillas will just be sitting and eating because that's the time of day they're at. So they're just having their lunch and they're just sitting around. Others are very active and your trek continues right. with them. So there is, Yeah, and that's where the park rangers that you're with um, are instrumental because they're going to keep opening up the bush so that you can keep following the animals as they move. Um, I think generally they're fairly sedentary, but that definitely can happen that they can, they can move. Um, and every, every encounter is different um, just because this, what we've said, these are wild animals. They have different dynamics. Um, you can, you can visit the same family two days in a row and have different things happening. So it really, it really is individual to each trek you know exactly how long but you're generally with them for about an hour whether there's a close-up sedentary viewing or if it's as they're on the move um, it's just dependent on the day and another thing um just you have a 99 percent chance of seeing them um we in all our time of gorilla trekking i think we only once did we have one guest who didn't quite see them well because the silverback kidnapped one of the babies. So it was very, um, they just happened to stumble uh, into a very like unusual situation, but just so everyone knows you, you do see the gorillas pretty much every time. And um, yeah. they yeah. are keeping so really good tabs was. on where they are. So it, it, it is, it is pretty much of a sure thing. Um, Sorry. So, yeah. um, so when we were there, we were based in the Bahoma area at the Bahoma gate. Um, uh, which is again adjacent to Windy Impenetrable Forest National Park. Um, I wanted to just share a little bit about accommodations. I cannot and would not try to highlight everything that's an option um, in either of these countries. There's lots of great places to stay and it's a very individual choice, but I just wanted to show where I stayed and some of the um, places that we use but again, this is not to say that other things aren't just as good. Um, I, my, first, my first stop was at Mahogany Springs, which is um, in this picture, it was overlooking the park. Um, this hillside is actually, you can see there's a line here where the trees <clears throat> sort of stop and it becomes a little bit more open. To the right is the park um, and it just keeps going off to the right-hand side. So you're quite close um, and in Uganda, many of these lodges in this particular sector are all in a very similar area. Um, you even have the chance sometimes of gorillas coming down into where some of these lodges are located, which is kind of amazing. I did not have that happen to me, but it was um, kind of cool to think it might. Um, so Mahogany Springs is um, just an example of a very nice lodge. It's a mid-range lodge, super comfortable. Um, wonderful people there, which I think is something that was a consistent theme on my trip. Everyone I met was so friendly and nice. Um, Gorilla Forest Camp is right down the road from Mahogany Springs. Um, it's a really nice tented camp. Um, so something a little different, very comfortable, um, very, um, probably a few more amenities um, than at Mahogany Springs, but, um, but also just a very pleasant, pleasant place to be. And um, at a different sector is Clouds. Um, so Clouds is actually a little bit in the southern part of Windy. And this is one of the areas that you could, uh, excuse me, a lodge that you could use uh, because this is the area where the habituation treks take place. So um, it's also, um, I think either Elizabeth or Jamie just chimed in as far as locations for the gorilla trekking. Um, we actually have some clients who choose to do a trek in between locations. So you can actually walk with a guide through Bwindi and go from the Bahoma area up to this, or excuse me, down to the Southern Gate area um, and then spend nights at two different lodges in the Bwindi area. Um, we like using clouds. Um, it's, it's just, a beautiful place and um, they have amazing view there um, which I wanted to highlight in this picture but from there I went um, to visit another kind of primate so chimpanzee trekking um, this is definitely a big part of primate trekking in Uganda I think um, 
this, <clears throat> I was at Chambora Gorge. Um, and there's another area called Chibali, which is probably the most famous place in Uganda for chimpanzee trekking. Um, the chimpanzee trekking is really interesting and quite different than gorilla trekking. Um, with the parts of it are the same. Um, I remember I talked about going to the park headquarters. Similar idea, you've got a guide. You don't necessarily need a porter for this. Um, it's a little bit less um, rigorous as far as the physical aspect of it. Um, but you would go out with your, with your park ranger and then you have one hour once you reach um, the chimpanzee group as well. Um, so definitely some similarities. Um, the locations in Uganda for chimpanzee trekking are a little bit flatter. Um, there's definitely a hike down into and out of this gorge, but once you're there, it's fairly flat um, and similar to Chibali where the terrain is actually fairly flat. So that part is a bit easier. The thing that is very different though, um, is that the chimpanzees are on the move a lot more. So from a, from a mobility standpoint, there's a lot of um, going after them because they're constantly heading off doing something else. And they're up in the trees, they're also down on the ground, they're kind of everywhere. Um, so, and they're really loud. It's actually really exciting and fun to trek for them. Um, I had a really enjoyable time and we had a, a really cool um, encounter. This was a slightly blurry picture, but this is one of the chimpanzees that I was trekking and she had captured a, a monkey called a red-tailed monkey that is hanging right here. Um, and so her whole family was trying to catch up with her to see if they could steal that red-tailed monkey from her um, and she wasn't letting them. So it was really exciting. Just highlighting again, chimpanzees, um, prime trekking locations in Uganda and lots of um, habituated families as well. But just because they're habituated does not mean that they don't move around a lot. Um, so it is, it is definitely an exciting one hour <laughs> encounter trying to sort of keep up with them, but really fun. So when I was at Chambora Gorge, I was also, that is part of Queen Elizabeth National Park in the Northern sector. Um, some people that are familiar with Uganda may also know Queen Elizabeth because of tree climbing lions, which are something, a behavior that occurs more often in the Southern sector of the park. Um, and I wasn't able to go everywhere on this trip. So I didn't see that, um, that area or that behavior. But I did go out with the, um, with the carnivore researcher that I had mentioned earlier. And um, both in this photo, both the leopard and the lion were animals that we were tracking with that researcher and their vehicle. Um, so it was pretty um, great to be able to know that we were gonna see big cats and also to learn a little bit more about these individuals, um, what their family situation was that kind of thing. This area is also great because there is boating in the area. So there's a big channel, the Kazinga Channel, and you can go on a really nice riverboat cruise um, safari. We saw so many animals, lots and lots of birds, um, obviously elephant in this picture, hippo, buffalo, um, just lots of crocodiles. It was really, it was really amazing. Um, more than I had expected. Yeah, because I was going to say, Laura, you've been on safari, I would say, probably almost 30 times at the, by now. Um, was it still, a, like, it, when you compare really, it to your other experiences, how did it feel? Yeah, no, it was great. Um, there's so many elephants. It was actually really, really an amazing um, afternoon. And we, again, we just, we saw a lot of diversity um, in the park itself. There is as well. Um, and then I'm, I'm not super knowledgeable about birds. I like birding, but I'm not a pro. Um, but that was another aspect that was just amazing. Just so much bird life, which um, was really enjoyable. So yeah, I was a big fan. And I was also a fan of this guy in this picture for the, <laughs> who did a very simple, probably fourth grade science experiment for us. And it was so much fun um, when you're on the equator to see the different ways that the water swirls when you're on the north, the south, 
and then at the equator. It was a really um, fun stop on the side of the road right at the equator. I don't know if anybody had ever done that before, but I thought it was really fun. I remember it when I was six years old. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> Simple, but really good. Okay, and then um, back to Chambora Gorge. Um, so this is, again, part of Queen Elizabeth National Park. Um, it's a really, this river is, runs through the gorge. Um, it's where in a different area, I was doing the chimpanzee trekking, but it's a big gorge um, and it actually comes right through to where the lodge I happened to be staying at was located. Um, so with a guide, you can do walking trails um, through this gorge area, through a community conservation buffer, um, which is where there are, they're really trying to keep mostly elephant and also predators away from community areas. Um, and I was able to see sort of a, a beekeeping scheme there, which was really interesting. Um, so it was definitely a beautiful area um, to be in. Chimbora Lodge is a lovely place to stay in this region. Um, and there's a lot of other nice lodges as well. So really comfortable. Um, another area that I was able to visit in Uganda was Kadepo, um, which is way up in the north. And it's the one that I mentioned that was, um, you know, really, I don't think not very visited. And I could be wrong, but I believe that I was the first person from Extraordinary Journeys maybe to even head up there. Um, it was really felt very fortunate. It's a beautiful area, lots and lots and lots of wildlife. Um, I stayed at a Poka Lodge, which is featured in this big panorama picture. I took this picture from their um, viewing tower. We had really great lion trekking there. Uh, excuse me, not lion trekking, lion <laughs> watching from vehicles. I was not on foot with the lions, um, but a really great multi-hour experience. So their guides were very good there and really um, understood how interesting it is and good to spend time with animals. Um, and so that was a, a real plus. The pool, just looking across, um, just to show um, definitely, you know, a beautiful place, really comfortable. There I am. And I think when we were talking, what you loved about it was just that sense of remoteness, you know, it's really, just... there's nothing there. It's amazing. There's just mountains, um, you know, ringing this huge, huge, huge Savannah area. Um, there's water holes, there's a big marsh. Um, they definitely, what this picture, these pictures don't capture is really how much wildlife is there. I saw a herd of probably a thousand buffalo at one point. It was amazing. Um, you know, other plains games, there's lots and lots of shy leopards, apparently. We did not see a leopard, but, um, but they're there. And um, yeah, just lots of elephants. Um, some giraffe, there was, it was really, it was really lovely. And this is a classic safari location. So you have normal things like bush breakfasts and sundowners and it, you know, it feels very much like an East African safari location, but just without, gosh, we saw hardly any other vehicles at all. So it was, it felt really special. And that would be true in both like right now traveling and in other times because there's only really yeah, like there's not that many lodges up here. I think probably that will keep changing. Um, I, I would imagine there'll be more more tourism up at up in this area in Kadepo, but right now and probably for the next few years, um, it's sort of a undiscovered gem, I think. Um, I just wanted I'm also aware of the time. <laughs> I'm talking a lot. Um, just wanted to highlight a few other things for Uganda. Um, one of the really wonderful things was um, just spending time, different ways of experiencing the community. Um, there's some amazing projects to explore in different locations. Um, I've got a co coffee cooperative here on the left, um, Ride for a Woman, which was just a, has a lot of different facets to it from um, clean water to jobs for women um, that are often you know, compromised in some way. So it's lots of stuff for kids. Um, there's definitely a, a lot of good things happening in Uganda to visit. Um, just a few more um, things to do um, that I didn't even get a chance to do, but there's 
really good hiking for those that are interested in proper hiking, not necessarily for primates, but going on really good walks and hikes. Um, there's beautiful mountains there. Um, this is a picture that I took from a different um, river cruise that was at Murchison Falls. Um, again, the boating opportunities and, and water safari opportunities are great. Rafting, um, for those that want adventuresome rafting, Jinja is the place, sort of the adrenaline capital of Uganda. And just wanted to mention again, the habituation option um, for a primate safari, as well as the carnivore research um, that you can you know, go out with them for a full or a half day. And it's really interesting. And that is the last slide for Uganda. And then we only have a little time left, but I want to talk about Rwanda, which is an equally wonderful place. Um, so Rwanda is much smaller. Um, again, let's look at this map where we are looking for at the green parts here. Um, on the right hand side is Akagira National Park. At the bottom left is Nyungwe. And at the very top here, it's very small is where the gorillas are at the Volcanoes National Park. Rwanda is, um, is a compact country. It is very well organized. Um, things are very much on time. It is safe feeling um, and definitely has a lot of high end accommodations um, very purposefully. I think the country, because it's small, they're trying to maximize their tourism revenue um, by having some really beautiful lodges that cost a lot, um, but are lovely and, and you know definitely offer a great experience. Um, just getting around, transfers are a bit shorter um, by road. They're twisty, turny roads, but they're not too, too long. Um, and there are helicopter transfers, so um, less regular flights, or not really any regular flights, fixed wing flights, um, but more in the way of helicopter transfers. Um, there's really one main place, Nyangwe, for chimpanzees and volcanoes for gorillas. Um, permits here for gorillas are more costly. Um, they are 1500 per person per trek. Rwanda is often identified with its um, 1994 genocide. Um, there's an openness in talking about it when you're in the country, as well as um, I highly, we all highly recommend everyone go to the genocide memorial when you are in Kigali. It's definitely very interesting. Um, the chimpanzee, gorillas, classic safari and culture all come together to create just a really wonderful country to visit um, and definitely can be a standalone destination. So in Kigali, we have um, a, a lot of really great um, places to stay. And one of our favorites is the Retreat Hotel. Um, this is a small boutique hotel that is in uh, just a nice neighborhood. Um, another thing to highlight, the Genocide Memorial. Um, there's lots of good shopping, which I wanted to draw attention to good restaurants and even a new distillery. So it's actually, Kigali's got a lot going on. Um, it's trying to be a world-class city and really does offer people a lot that want to spend a couple of days there. When I was in Rwanda, my first stop um, on safari was at Agagira and it is a, has a huge lake in the middle of it. Um, really beautiful. Um, this is the only place that has sort of classic safari, um, but it is really lovely and remarkable. Um, and it's been re, these animals have been to some degree reintroduced. It was a park that had lost a lot of animals due to poaching. Um, so their lion pride is, I want to say it's, when I was there, I believe it was up to 17 individuals um, and doing really well. So I think um, there's going to be, and there's a lot of leopard there as well. Um, so there's definitely, you know, good, good um, cats to see, as well as the reintroducing rhino, black rhino, um, and there's elephant, giraffe, um, typical plains game. So really a really nice place to go on safari. 
Buffalo. How could I forget? They're there down by the- uh, It's just the- very beautiful. And it's just, yeah. Um, yeah, the experience and everyone who's gone back, I mean, including yourself and other, I mean, it's just the feedback always come back is the beauty of the area. And it's just such a beautiful setting. It is. It really is with that lake in the middle. It's just, it's, it's lovely. Um, and the, the tented camp there that's on its own concession. So you have a lot of the thing, just flexibility. Um, they're starting to do, I believe they're going to start to do walking safaris, but you can do boat safaris as well as um, typical game drives from this gorgeous setting. It's, it's a lovely little camp. So uh, Laura, I'm just going to give you, we are, I think we should try to go through the gorilla trekking because I think there's a lot of questions that are going to come up and I want to try to keep it under. Let's do it. So, <laughs> so then you're going to, um, then I headed to um, the volcanoes, which is the Virunga mountain chain. Um, again, setting off trekking for the gorillas that day. Um, you can see the terrain difference. Um, this is an agricultural field. And then this is the mountain that we're heading up to just lower canopy, smaller trees, um, really, um, and, and generally a slightly less steep as far as trekking goes in Rwanda. Um, in Rwanda, this again, I've got this picture just to show the foliage and the terrain trekking. Um, and this was two years ago, pre-COVID, not wearing a mask um, and getting a bit closer to the gorilla there. different lodges. Um, again, I mentioned it was upscale. We've got, um, this is a picture from the Sati, which is really a funky design, very nature inspired. Singita's got Quinta, Quintanda, um, which is set in a really flat area looking up at the mountain. Um, so it's a sort of a different setting and it's quite pretty. Um, Gorilla's nest is sort of nestled in the forest. And then there's um, others like Barunga Lodge, Sabino Silverback Lodge. There's so many great places to stay. I mentioned helicopter transfers. Now that is a fun way to get around. Um, it's actually can not be that much more expensive than driving um, at times. And we had all these kids come and check out our helicopter there. It was really fun. And then we, we were hanging out and meeting them and chatting with them as well. That's really fun. This is um, a picture uh, just looking down from the helicopter. I flew from the volcanoes area over to Nyungwe, um, and you can see how um, this is a tea plantation, how much agriculture there is. It's a small country and they're using lots of it for agriculture. Um, this is a picture to try to show the twisty turny roads. Um, it is a land of a thousand hills. It is lots and lots of turns and lots of up and down, um, but you'd have a professional driver who's taking you from A to B to C um, in Rwanda in really comfortable cars. So it's, it's, you're not in a, not in a, you know, bumpy truck or anything like that. Um, it's all enclosed and comfortable. And the roads are pretty smooth. Like they are they're, actually, they're very exactly. well maintained. So it's not like potholes or any yeah, of that. Exactly. It's, it's, um, yeah, that drive between Kigali and going out to Volcanoes is about three or three and a half hours. And yes, it is, it has turns, but the road itself is quite, is quite smooth and it's a beautiful drive. Um, so my last stop um, so was at Nyungwe National Park. Um, and this is where there are chimpanzees to trek as well as golden monkeys, um, colobus monkeys, there's other, other. Um, excuse me, there's not golden monkeys here, there's colobus monkeys and other kinds of monkeys. Um, in these pictures, chimpanzees and colobus, um, as well as just general nice trekking. Um, there's, it's a place where you could spend days and just do different hikes. There's one really nice um, lodge here that is one and only is Nyungwe House, um, which is lovely and um, definitely, to me, it felt like a great place to end a trip. I happened to end my trip there um, because it's just a very, it's just such a scenic area um, and very relaxing feeling. Um, this was a really fun little pop-up private lunch that they set up for me because I had missed a meal, God forbid, on safari, I missed a meal and they um, wanted to make sure that I had it. So <laughs> it was really just to show there is the luxury level is definitely there in Rwanda if one is seeking it out. 
I had some fantastic community experiences there. Um, I did tea plant, well, I visited the tea plantation. I did picking. Um, we were doing dancing um, with people at a different um, community visit. I had a whole day of immersion um, with some local women outside of Kigali where I had fetched water. I even I helped make a meal. I hoed in the fields. Um, and I learned not well how to make just a little bit of basketry. I'm wearing the earrings that go with this necklace that um, I, I sort of made with a lot of help from that nice lady. <laughs> we had fun though. It was really cool. It looks so um, nice. Just more, more pictures from community things. I was really lucky. Um, I got to see uh, a lot of different people and have some really nice visits there um, and great dancing and music, of course. Um, some other things, this, um, this is one of the gorillas that I saw. Um, so just again, fantastic for primate viewing. Um, I planted a tree, um, which is just part of an initiative that I think several lodges have to just trying to reforest um, habitat loss is one of the biggest problems in places like Rwanda for wildlife. So recognizing that and um, you know, maybe making a donation and planting a tree, it's a really good thing to do. Um, and this is just a very cool um, walkway at Nyangui um, where I said, you know, it's chimpanzee trekking, but then a lot more. It's just, it's a beautiful forest to explore. So linking it all together, um, I'm not going to spend too much time here because um, planning a safari is very unique to each person, but just wanted to highlight that um, during non-COVID times, their flights actually work really well to link together the Mara, the Serengeti with um, Uganda and Rwanda in different ways. Um, as I think my talk today, though, also should have highlighted that these are both countries that can operate as standalone destinations as well, um, which during these times where maybe going to one country is more of interest and not hopping all around. Um, it's just good to realize that. I mean, I, I spent almost two weeks in Uganda and, and didn't do everything. So it definitely is a place you can delve in deeper. Um, and same Rwanda smaller, but um, you know, spending three days in three different places in, in Rwanda is, is a great, great way to see that country as well. Um, just wanted to mention COVID testing. Um, we can set, we have had clients that have gone to multiple countries, um, including Rwanda and Uganda. We can set up the testing. It's complicated. It keeps changing, but we're on top of it and we will help any of our clients navigate that process. And just to go over quickly, just in case people are wondering how they're, what the requirements are right now, and maybe, sorry, Laura, I'm, I may have like jumped in there. No. Um, right now, you need a COVID test 72 hours before arrival for Rwanda, uh, before departure for your trip for Rwanda. Uganda was 72 hours as well, correct? Yes. Um, in Rwanda, they will test you again upon arrival, um, and you will quarantine for 24 hours at one of the hotels. For example, the retreat that we really love is a place where you will wait for your results. And until you get your test results, and they will guarantee it within 24 hours, then you're allowed to go explore the country. Uganda does not do that. So Uganda, as long as you have a negative COVID test, right. you can start exploring. They will also test you on the way out from Uganda. So you will have to, and they do a really good job, and, and Laura will go over that. Um, but you will get tested before departure, which is re regardless, they did it before we was required to get back to United States. I think the idea was just to be able to do contact tracing if anything had happened. Um, so there was a very good reason for it, but it's actually turned out to be really good that they had it set up because you do need a negative COVID test to be able to fly back to the US. And Rwanda, they're even, they will check you every five days right now and within 72 hours of each new national park or each gorilla trek. So. Um, but they are so well, um, we've just been so impressed at how well they've been doing the testing and how fast they are getting the test results. So, sorry, Laura, I just kind of jumped No, that's great. Right. I appreciate you. <laughs> and it works, works perfectly with my next slide here, which is just on the ground, um, my experience in Uganda just now, um, just threw in these couple of things just to show there's hand washing stations all over the place, your temperature's taken every time you come and go from everywhere, um, lodges and airports, um, there's hand sanitizer everywhere. 
just every vehicle, like at every turn, there's hand sanitizer. Um, the camp and lodge staffs are all um, super respectful about wearing masks all the time. Um, even, and this is us in, a, in the airplane wearing masks. Uh, and then we did COVID testing headed out of Entebbe, which is this slide um, that just shows, I have that in backwards order here, but um, it's just a very simple clinic that you can go to. Our driver, we had set it up ahead of time. You get dropped off there with your driver waits for you. The whole thing took maybe 20 minutes. Um, and then the results are back. You can actually pay different costs to get your results back at different times, but it was, you know, generally it's within six or 12 hours. You have your results back and you get a piece of paper that they print off for you that has your code and you're good to go when you look, go back to the airport. And they do check at the airport every everywhere. <laughs> there was multiple places to get that negative test checked. Um, and just as we wrap up um, with the thoughts of primate trekking, there are actually some other places in the world. So we've highlighted Uganda and Rwanda, um, but there's some other spots too that are great for primates. Um, this photo is from Grace Joke Mahali in Tanzania. Um, we love chip trekking there and it's an overall just amazing experience at Grace Joke. Um, it's not a big five game experience, but it's a really intimate remote lodge um, that does everything right. Um, so that is a picture of that. Um, and then Odzala Discovery Camps um, over in the Republic of the Congo. I know there's can be confusing with the different Congos, but this is a really remote area that's quite safe. Um, and they have the lowland gorillas there. So it's different than the mountain gorillas, which there are only about, I guess, roughly a thousand of mountain gorillas. There are a lot more lowland gorillas um, in going to the Congo, seeing all the different species there um, in, in addition to the gorillas would be really amazing. So we just got a quick picture of Greystoke, fantastic chimpanzee trekking here. Um, and lots of other things to do with the lakeside setting, lots of beautiful uh, forest to explore as well, bird life. And then at Adzala in the Congo, just all kinds of adventures in addition to gorilla trekking, um, kayaking, doing different treks through, um, you know, through the forest and out to the bays. There's elephant, buffalo. Um, it's just a really, pristine um, area to go to and very privileged few get to go there. And, and I think that's going to be a whole presentation itself. I mean, Jenny yeah. <laughs> in our office can talk about this for Definitely. hours. I yeah. think this was one of her highlights. So maybe a different presentation we can go in into because it's a very different experience altogether. Very much so. Um, so yeah, that's that is what I wanted to share. Um, I think we're just in an hour. So I don't know, if Elizabeth, do you want to take yeah, I see one question, which I actually, um, the habituation experience, um, can you just kind of explain what is different between a normal experience, which is an hour, and the habituation experience? Oh, and that, I was going to say that as far, and I didn't do it, um, I don't know if, and you welcome Elizabeth to chime in, yeah. um, but as far as I know, it's, um, it's four hours and you are in a smaller group of people. Um, the cost is as opposed 1500. to 100, it's 1500 per person for the habituation trek. And um, how, how I, how it was described to me, it was really that it is um, a lot more movement. Uh, you're moving more because these gorillas are not used to people yet. So it's a very um, physical exercise. Um, and it really is a little bit, it's, it, it can kind of come change as far as how much time you get to actually spend in close proximity. Um, you could work out to have a, you know, a family that is pretty chill and they'll, you'll see a lot of them in those four hours and you could just end up also with a family that's on the move a lot and get some more glimpses than settle down eating type of thing. But you're also, you know, talking to the the Africa Parks kind exactly. of guides and, and really just diving into, you know, what it takes to habituate gorillas and and other animals for for that matter. And I think that there's getting a different to learn a lot with that. Um, not that you're not learning in the one hour one, but it's it's just I think it, it's a, that's why I was mentioning it's like a deeper dive into if you yeah. really have a strong interest in primates. I think 
someone would get a lot out of that. But you always have to be very careful that, as, as you said, you know, they're not habituated. So it can, they are shy. They, sometimes you can be lucky, you can see them, but you have to be prepared that being four hours, it's not four hours with a habituated family. It is a family that is moving. It is a family that is not used to humans. Um, so you shouldn't be disappointed if you didn't, you know, you're, it's, it's an entirely different experience from that. Yeah, standpoint. and for any of our clients that wanna to, want to explore that idea, um, we can, I think, talk more about it and, and share some more details. You'd probably want to do both. You'd want to do one regular gorilla trek and a habituation. A habituation itself could be a little bit hit or miss sometimes in that sense. Um, so we would try to do, I think having both a regular gorilla experience and the habituation would be kind of the perfect way of doing it. Agreed. Um, you know, there were some interesting questions. Um, there was an election in Uganda. People were asking yeah. if you felt safe. You were there right afterwards. We Those actually- were a couple of weeks afterwards, um, and I did feel safe. Um, I definitely was quite aware of it. Um, and the, the one thing that not, nothing happened at all when I was there, but the one thing that was um, interesting was that the government was still limiting um, social media when, when we were there. So um, it was you know, things like Facebook and WhatsApp and whatnot did not work. So there's a, there's a workaround that we were able to do for part of the time, but it was that was kind of a strange feeling <laughs> to have that, um, but there was, but um, there was, it was calm in Entebbe and there was no, I asked a few people about it and, you know, I think, I think that it was, it wasn't as, like many things in the media kind of can make things kind of crazy. The other question um, was a time of year, um, when is the best time, you know, is there a best time to travel to East Africa, uh, to Uganda? Well, I can't answer the question there, but <laughs> to Rwanda and, and, uh, and Uganda. So I think you... they really are year round destinations. Um, there is a rainier time of year, which would make, um, which is kind of uh, our early spring. So I feel like it's like sort of you know, March, April, May would probably be more challenging. Um, and then just because of, because of rain, um, but I was there in what should be dry season. It was, we also had rain on the trek. So I think rain can happen um, anytime in the areas that you're actually trekking. Um, but, you know, there certainly are, our summer months are, are relatively dry, um, sort of, you know, June through September, there can be a little bit of rain in September and October. Uh, someone asked about bugs. Did you feel it was buggy while you were hiking, going gorilla trekking? Um, it, it's funny. It wasn't particularly buggy, um, but they they have like little gnats, which I didn't even notice until I looked at some of my videos, which is kind of silly. Like I really didn't even notice that they were there. And then when I was watching my videos, I could see them sort of buzzing around. Um, so it's not a crazy buggy environment. Um, it is warm and moist, so there are but there are certainly bugs. Um, we saw some snails and stuff too, which I really hadn't ever seen on a trek before. So, um, but it wasn't wasn't a crazy amount. Yeah, there. Someone was asking about bringing your own raincoats and everything. Yes, you. Yeah. They, they don't provide it really. Like you yeah. do have to kind of. I mean. Yeah, and we tell you every, you know, we tell all of our clients that um, raincoats for sure. Um, gloves, there can be a kind of a plant called a stinging nettle. So it's good to wear like a garden glove. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, you can use, they give you walking sticks when you go to the park headquarters, which is really nice. You don't have to bring your own walking stick, but um, it's, it's good to have. And it's good to have real hiking shoes because it is, it can be slippery. Something with ankle support is, is really helpful. Um. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, another question, um, is a standalone trip to Rwanda, Uganda, is it, how does it compare in price to other safari destination? Other, I mean, other than the safari, I mean, the gorilla permits are your most expensive part. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, honestly, I think Rwanda, just because of the way the lodges are, it can be an expensive destination. Um, there are some ways to, to work around that a bit, but overall, I think Rwanda's pretty pricey. Um, and Uganda, I think, would be on a par with other East African countries if you take the permits out. Um, question about malaria. Did you need to take malaria pills? Yes, definitely. Because you're also, you're in proximity with other communities and people there. So you're not just off by yourselves. So 
Yeah, there, I, I, if I missed, I mean, I think I've read through the questions. I hope I didn't miss anything. If there are any, um, yeah, there are a lot of questions about which pills. There's no shot for malaria. If, oh, do you need any vaccination in general? Um, we <laughs> did a yellow fever vaccination to go to Uganda. Um, and then in terms of malaria pills, you know, of course you have to talk to your doctors, um, which one I, the most common one nowadays is Malarone, uh, is what most people take, what they take for on safari. That's probably what most people are taking. Yeah, and but, that's what I took as well. So, yeah, it's just, yeah. Same advice as we would always give is to check with your doctor just to be sure, but we, and we provide everybody with what's normal and necessary. Um, mm. okay. Few more questions. Uh, there's one about uh, visas. Um, did you need a visa? Um, yes, you can need <laughs> a visa to, to visit either country um, and they can be obtained in advance. Um, and some people obtained the Uganda one there. I did it in advance and it was a pretty painless process. And then actually the next question was about crossing borders. What's interesting with the visa is you can now get an East African visa. So you can use the same visa, for example, for um, to get into multiple countries, um, which is quite nice, um, has made the combination of, you know, especially with Kenya. Unfortunately, Tanzania is not part of that deal, but you can definitely combine it with Kenya quite yeah. easily. Um, any cr issues crossing country borders? Um, no. In normal times, absolutely not. Obviously right now with COVID, you do need to get COVID. To, every country has their own COVID requirements. So for example, Kenya, if you want to go to Kenya, you would need to have a COVID test um, within 72 hours, um, within 96 hours of arrival in Kenya. So what works out really nicely though right now is that you can get, since you need a COVID test every five days right now, every, well, 72 hours before each trek, for example, in Rwanda, you're, you can use your COVID test from Rwanda to get into Kenya, something with Uganda. It's very easy to get these COVID tests in Africa right now to go from country to country. I mean, we had someone who went oh, in January, I mean, they went from Kenya to Tanzania. I mean, they went Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, back to Kenya, down to Uganda, uh, down to South Africa, and they must have had eight different COVID tests and it all went seamless. So it's not that they had planned their trip to go this way, it just went in that direction because of changes they had to go. Um, just an, on that note, my piece of advice during COVID, you have, I, I think it can be, and you can tell me how your experience was traveling right now, um, but you have to have a, you have to go with a, you kind of have to be flexible. It can be an amazing experience, you know, do the social distancing, all of, all of the above, um, but you also have to be extremely flexible um, during these times. I agree. I think, you know, and, and being really detail oriented, um, which we are proactively for our clients and the clients also need to kind of own it when they're on the ground, as far as testing and timing and things like that, and making sure um, that you're, you're on top of things. Um, but yeah, I think just knowing that things could change is, is a good way to look at, look at, you know, at a trip and just being able to know, you know, the airlines are flexible right now. Um, you've got a good team if you're there and you need something, you know, does change, we'll, we've got your back. But they do change, you know, like <laughs> flights are changing, but yeah. we're all, we have teams everywhere. We're able to accommodate all of it and it's gone. Everything's worked out well, but if you had a specific, if you had to be back on a specific day at a specific hour, that may yeah. not happen. Like you have, people have had to add a day here or there. Um, you just, it just the flights are, you know, they're consolidating flights. You just have to know that they may cancel a flight. There's always another flight we can get you on, but you know, it's just how travel is right now. Um, and then the question about using guides or, you know, if you're a group, you can get a private guide with, you know, that we work with throughout your trip. And you may have a private guide driver in Uganda with you the whole time, especially if you're doing a driving safari. Um, but if you're doing fly, flying, sometimes we would use the local guides of each property or each area. So again, that just depends. Each, everything we do at Extraordinary Journeys is a custom trip. So depending on your budget, your group, your setup, um, the, how we do it may just be different for each person um, based on the time you have. So Laura, any last parting remarks about your trip oh, that you want people to remember? 
I just I just wanted to say again that it's um, it was a real privilege to go and see these great apes and um, I would highly recommend it to anyone um, and just come to us with questions. I mean, like as Elizabeth just said, everything we do is on a custom basis. So, um, you know, ask away. We're here to help and to inform if it's not a trip for this year, then, you know, it can be a year or two from now, but it's it's fun to start daydreaming about travel again. Yeah, we hope you you're, you're excited. There will be I hope as everyone gets vaccinated, you know, um, Marsha, who's the co-founder, my mother, who's on the call, just gave me some bad. She finally got her second vaccine. So hopefully that will be traveling, but also that's, it all started in Uganda for Marsha. That is where she went to the Peace Corps. That's how she discovered Africa back in the sixties. So, you know, these are special places for us. We, we do have a lot of history there. So awesome. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining. And <laughs> okay, have a great, great afternoon. <laughs> Bye. Thanks very much. Well, that was a good overview. Oh, perfect. Yeah, if everyone wants to unmute now, too, I mean, feel free. I mean, we are around. So <laughs> we just we have to mute from experience because otherwise, there's always a dog barking or something happening or. <laughs> Appreciate the overview. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for joining. Okay. Oh, great. Marsha, we can't see you. I know. So. Good. Well, I think this is it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone.